searched all over, couldn't find nobody. I searched high and low, still couldn't find nobody. Nobody greater, nobody greater, nobody greater than you. Searched all over, couldn't find nobody. I searched high and low, still couldn't find nobody. Nobody greater, nobody greater, Lord. There's nobody greater than you. Your name. Above all names, you're worthy of all our praise. You're worthy of all oh, our praise. Oh, and mighty are the works of your hands. 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 Your name. Welcome back to Covenant Lifehouse Ministries. Wherever you are, thank you for joining the broadcast that's coming from our sanctuary this morning. We are glad to see you again. We're glad to have you worshiping with us again and uh, to partake in this series that we are having, Life Lessons from Jonah. Last week in part one, it was you can run, but you can't hide. And my prayer for everyone that listened to that message is that it left you with the thought, what is your Nineveh and what are you running away from God for? And the life lessons that we learned from that message are posted on the Covenant Lifehouse Ministries Facebook page, or you can just go right to YouTube and listen to that powerful message again. But today we continue with part two of the series with the message entitled, Good Trouble. And our scripture is from the first chapter of Jonah, and we are going to have verses 7 through 16. That's Jonah, the first chapter, verses 7 through 16. But first, let's go before the Lord in prayer so that we can bathe this word in prayer and that your spirit may be opened up to receive it receive it. Okay. Thank you, Lord, for this message. And as people listen on this morning, we know some people are hurting. Some people are grieving. Some people don't know what to do. But Lord, we come running to you, the rock that is higher than we are. We want to get under your wings, O God. Before the mountains even came forth, or ever thou proclaim anything else, you were always there. So thank you, Lord, that we are able to come to you. We are able to bring our hurts, our cares, our pains, and even our worship and adoration before you. On this morning, Lord, give us a word. Be with the speaker of the hour. Use my voice, use my words, but let it be the Holy Spirit speaking to someone. We thank you in advance in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We thank God for that word. And now please turn with me to the scripture for today. We're, finish, or we're coming back with Jonah again, the first chapter, verses 7 through 16. First chapter, verses 7 through 16. And this is what we find recorded in Jonah 
chapter 1, verses 7 through 16. And throughout this series, all of our scripture from Jonah, we're going to be coming from the New King James Version. But this is what it says. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Please tell us, for whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation, and where do you come from? What is your country, and of what people are you? So he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. And then verse 10 says, Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Then they said to him, Shut, What shall we do to you that the sea may be calm before us? For the sea was growing more temptuous. And he said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. But I know this great tempest is for I know this great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to return to land, but they could not. For the sea continued to grow more temperatures around them. Therefore they cried out to the Lord and said, said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's sake, and do not charge us with innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. And then verse 15 says, So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from his raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. There's some good stuff in those verses. And we thank the Jehovah God for the reading of his word. And we pray that this word touches you in some way. And we learned last week that this story about Jonah is really about three different things. A part of the story is about the prophet Jonah, but that's not the big part. Another part of the story is about the lost people in Nineveh, but that's not the big part. The biggest part of the story is, you guessed it, it's about God. As a matter of fact, the entire Bible is more about God than it is about mankind. And when we finally get to the end of this book and the fourth chapter, we will discover that's why this book was written in the first place, to teach us more about God. The entire Bible is a revelation of God through Jesus Christ. And as I said, our message today is titled, Good Trouble. Have you heard that term recently? Of course you have. It's a statement made by the late representative John Lewis. And the full, full statement is, get in trouble, necessary trouble, and redeem the soul of America. And that was made on March 1st, 2020, while he was commemorating the tragic events on Bloody Sunday on the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama. He was nearly killed that day, yet he called it good trouble. On top of that, on numerous occasions, he risked his life setting up voter registration drives, uh, uh, setting up sit-ins at lunch counters, and he was beaten and arrested for challenging the injustice of Jim Crow segregation in the South, yet this brother called it good trouble. So in the message today, we are going to discover that the Lord God oftentimes brings good trouble into our lives. Someone say that with me. Good trouble. Yeah, good trouble. Now, if you think you know uh, the Jonah story or that this book is not for you, let me remind you of the basic background to the whole story. God never lost sight of his prophet. God never lost sight of the lost people in Nineveh. And God never loses sight of you. 
And when we were introduced to the prophet Jonah last week, we found him trying to run away from a God-given task. Now, I know some of you super Christians have never run from God or rejected what God was telling you. But that part of Jonah's story resonated with me because I have learned that just as Jonah learned, you can't run from God unless you end up running towards God. How are you going to get away from God? And Jonah had gotten on a ship, but God took care of that problem by ordering the sea to track down Jonah. And a huge storm showed up. And the huge storm erupted over the sea and everything pointed a finger to Jonah. So our story picks up right here with these verses found in verses 7 and 8. Let me read those again. And they, they being the sailors, said to one another, Come let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots. And the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Please tell us, for whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation? And where do you come from? What is your country? And what people are you from? And what people are you? The sailors decided to cast lots to determine which one of them had done something to cause this Bad luck to cause this storm to occur. And while studying for this message, I discovered something very interesting. Because of the dangers that sailors and fishermen faced, they had countless superstitions about safety and good luck. And some of those seem strange to us today. For instance, losing a hat overboard was a sign that it was going to be a bad, long trip. Stirring tea with a knife or fork, fork would invite bad luck. That sounded like something a man would do. It was bad luck for a sailor or a fisherman's wife to wave goodbye once he started on a journey because it would bring good luck. And ladies, check this one out. Women were said to bring bad luck on board because they distracted from the sailor's duties. I can see that one. So casting or drawing straws was not an unusual practice in settling important matters. As a matter of fact, casting lots to determine God's will is done several places in the Bible. Proverbs 16.33 even says this, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. But I'm telling you, I'm telling you, listen to this. The best course of, course of action is go straight to the Lord in prayer. Go straight to the Lord in prayer. This is one of the foundational scriptures about God leading us. So, uh, most of you know this. It's Proverbs 3rd chapter, verses 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with what? All your heart and lean not what? Unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. But now we see these hardcore unsaved sailors. They didn't know about the Lord. So they were casting and drawing lots because they wanted to have good luck. It's part of their superstition. They thought they had taken, listen to this, they thought they had taken every precaution to avoid bad luck and to avoid storm. Yet here they are right in the midst of a major storm. Now, their thought process led them to believe that someone on board must have done something. They must have broken one of the superstitious rules. They must have done something. But the short straw pointed right to Jonah. It pointed right to Jonah. Now, since there is no such thing as good luck, bad luck, chance, or coincidence, 
then something else must have pointed the finger at Jonah. Numbers 32, 23 puts it, puts it this way. Then take note, you have sinned against the Lord and be sure your sin will find you out. That means that the nature of sin is such that whether or not others discover your sin, your sin will discover you. In other words, sin has consequences. Sin always has consequences. Now, even though the sailors were not saved, isn't it amazing that we are just like them when something happens? When things become difficult and we don't know what to do or how to get out of what we're going through, when something really happens, sometimes we try some strange things to get an explanation of why it's happening. Amen, somebody. But I'm telling you, whatever you do, don't resort to superstitious type things. You might as well take that rabbit's foot from around your neck. And don't resort to superstitious stuff or ungodly actions like going to a fortune teller. Yeah, you heard it. And these people back in that time, they had many gods, small G gods. And they believed that every small G god belonged to a particular group of people or to a place. Therefore, Jonah's God must be punishing him by sending the storm after him. Look at the, question, the questions they asked him. What is your occupation? And where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? Isn't it amazing how God works? We run and run and run from the truth, but he will always bring us to the place where we finally have to face the truth. He always does that. We finally have to face the truth. Jonah had been living as a like an unbelieving person, and the sailors now find him out. So what are these verses telling us? You can either live like an unsaved person or you can live as a saved person, but you can't do both at the same time. So Jonah is busted and he has to confess his true identity. And look at his embarrassing confession in verse 9 and 10. So he said to them, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Now I say this is an embarrassing confession because Jonah, this man of God, who was supposed to be setting the example, had to fess up and say that he was running from his God. And look at some of the things in that verse. The men, the sailors wanted to know Jonah's occupation. Let's fast forward with that. The people at your workplace need to know you are a child of God. The sailors wanted to know where Jonah came from. As a child of God, people need to know that you are God's set ambassador, that you are on a mission, an assignment from God. And the sailors wanted to know who were Jonah's people. When you are connected to God's purposes and when you have come to faith in Jesus Christ, then you can tell them you are one of the people of God. Psalms 107.2 says this, Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. This brings us to our first uh, life lesson or our application. I'm going to say it nice and slow. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, then you need to live like you are a believer. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, then you need to live like you are a believer. Notice that Jonah in the text, he's really telling the crew who he is supposed to be and what he is supposed to do. 
Now, it's true that Jonah is a Hebrew. It's true that he's supposed to worship the Lord. As a matter of fact, Jonah knew the truth about God. Jonah even said God was the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. But it's not enough just to know facts about God. Say that again, Pastor. It's not enough to just know facts about God. And it's not enough just to quote scriptures. Even the devil knows how to quote scriptures. I read this quote the other day while studying for this. It's not so much that Christians have an image problem. It's far more likely that we have an integrity problem. Ouch. What I'm saying is, this is life lesson number two. Make sure your walk matches your talk. Make sure your walk matches your talk. There, there's a singer, some, most of you probably heard of him, called James Brown. Uh, he used to say, talking loud and saying nothing. Now, I know that's not biblical, but that will preach. What I'm saying is, we can't make all of these glorious proclamations about the Lord and then live or act like we don't even know the Lord. Let that sink in. We can't make all these glorious proclamations about the Lord and then live or act like we don't even know the Lord. When the world sees our walk not matching our talk, they have the right to ask us the same thing the sailors asked Jonah in verse 10. Why have you done this? The sailors became afraid and wanted to know how Jonah could run from his God that he said he knew so much about. How could he run from his God that he said he worshipped so much? You know what? In these verses, Jonah did acknowledge God. We'll give him that. But God also desires for us to acknowledge our sin. And as a child of God, he requires genuine repentance. Did you know that the more we are true to God's word, the smaller the gap is between who we are and who we say we are? If you say you are a child of God and you're basing that on the word of God and you're walking in the word of God, there's going to be a smaller gap into what people see. And the Bible actually has a word for a believer who says one thing but does another thing. That word is called hypocrite. When we admit, listen to this, when we admit our shortcomings, when we, now hear that as stop being a hypocrite. And when we admit that it is only because of Jesus Christ in our lives that we can get through every day, then that's when we build a bridge between us and those who need Jesus Christ. So if you are saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, then you are part of God's family. And as a part of God's family, he wants us to impact, inspire, and influence the people around us. Look at verses 11 through 15, and we're going to see how Jonah impacted the people around him on the ship. Then they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous, and he said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know this great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, the men rolled hard to return to land, but they could not. For the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord. Please do not let us perish for this man's life and do not charge us with innocent blood for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked Jonah up and threw him into the sea and the sea 
cease from his raging. Do you see the amazing response that uh, this crew gave to Jonah? This, this uh, amazing response from these unsaved sailors who had all kind of uh, a superstition. But when Jonah revealed who he was, they didn't want to throw him overboard. They tried to avoid throwing him overboard, and instead they tried to row back to, to dry land. But that was not going to work. When God causes the storm, it's God who has to end the storm. No matter how hard you try, if everybody on board is rowing, it's God who has to stop the storm. And this is a good lesson right here, too. This is a good lesson right here that we can't assume we can judge the hearts of the people around us. This is going to be good, right? We can't judge the hearts of the people around us. I saw this quote also. It says, very few people get judged into life change. Far more get loved into it. Let me say that again. Very few people get judged into life change. Far more get loved into it. Jesus was all about love. He came to love us. And before God did anything else, while we were yet sin sinners, God demonstrated, guess what? His love to us. We never know how our lives are going to touch the lives of people around us. Pay attention sometimes to how, how people act around you. You or I may not be the most perfect example of living for God, but there should be something from the inside coming to the outside that's going to cause people to look for Jesus Christ. That brings us to our next life lesson, life lesson number three. What you do impacts how the people around you experience the kingdom of God. What you do impacts how the people around you experience the kingdom of God. Jonah knows it's all his fault. So when the sailors ask what they should do to make the seas calm again, he tells them to pick me up and throw me into the sea and it'll become calm again. When I studied this passage, a thought came to me. Jonah could have easily jumped overboard. Why did he involve the sailors? Why did he tell the sailors, you pick me up? Oftentimes when we are sinning, there are consequences to our sin that involves other people. But two thoughts came to my mind. The first is theological. In a theological sense, Jonah points to Jesus. Both Jonah and Jesus were willing to give up their lives to save sinners. But then it also came to me from a human perspective, Jonah was not that noble. What Jonah was trying to do from a human perspective, the easiest way for Jonah to get out of going to Nineveh was to die at sea at someone else's hand. So he said, you pick me up and you throw me in the water. You know, and like I said, our actions impact the people around us and they see the kingdom either in a positive sense or a negative sense because of us. Just ask someone who is in a family with an alcoholic or a drug addict. They can tell you that that person said, I'm the alcoholic, but it affects everyone in the entire family. And you, what I'm saying is you probably have a friend or even a relative who isn't a follower of Jesus Christ, right? But have you ever thought of how you might be affecting their willingness to put their trust in Jesus? Maybe your life and your choices are keeping them from coming to Jesus Christ. Oh yeah, they see how you leave on Sunday morning going out to church, but they see how you are when you come back from church. 
They see how you are on Monday through Saturday. And with the current chaos in our country, people are looking for truth, people are looking for sincerity, and people are looking for authenticity. Not just in their political leaders or their politicians and preachers, but especially in those who are children of God. But did you know that some trouble can be good trouble? What? Say that again, Pastor. I think I misheard you. Yeah, some trouble can be good trouble. One of the primary means that God uses to make you and me like Jesus Christ is by sending a storm or trouble our way. You see, reshaping us into the image of Jesus Christ takes major surgery. It takes major transformation. And God says, I'll reduce it down to three types of uh, storms he sent in our lives. So God sends what's called a uh, protecting storm. Jesus did that many times with his his disciples to keep their egos in check and to learn that they had to depend on him. That's a protecting storm to protect them from themselves and protect us from our own selves. And God also sends a perfecting storm. These are the everyday storms that we go through, everyday trials we go through, everyday hardships that we go through. And it's part of our Christian journey that God does not to harm you, not to hurt you, but to make you look more like Jesus Christ. And then God also sends correcting storms. Jonah found himself in a correcting storm. It's, it wasn't necessarily punishment because God was really showing him mercy and pulling Jonah back to him. And none of these storms, none of this trouble lasts forever. Because you can be sure that God is up to something in the storm for our good and for his glory. Say that with me, for our good and his glory. And you know what? We define ourselves by our circumstances or our experiences in life. But you know, God never does that. God uses the storm as good trouble in our lives. Someone say good trouble. And lesson number four, life lesson number four is God uses trouble to shape us into the image of Jesus. When a sculpture is going to make a statue and he has a piece of marble, it looks like a big slab of rock. But inside of it, he sees the masterpiece. And he has to chip away at it little by little to reveal the statue that's inside, the masterpiece inside. That's what God does. We are his masterpiece, but he has to chip away a little bit at a time to shape us and form us into the image of Jesus Christ. So God is chipping away at us by using troubles to reshape us good trouble. Look at verses 14 and 15. It shows the impact that Jonah had on the sailors when all hope seemed to be lost. He didn't just have a negative impact. He had a positive impact also because they knew Jonah's God must be a powerful God. So they decided to pray to Jonah's God. Look at verses 14 and 15. Therefore, they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life and do not charge us with innocent blood for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea and the sea ceased from his raging. And soon as the sea got calm, the text said that the sailors started worshiping God. The sailors, in effect, moved from fearing the storm to fearing God. 
They move from fearing the storm to fearing God. Fearing God is another way of saying worshiping God. By the way, be careful about how you decide who needs to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't be quick to jump to conclusions about other people saying they'll never be saved. Oh, Uncle Joe has always been that way. He'll never be saved because things aren't always as they appear on the surface. Some people will benefit from the good trouble that Jesus Christ puts in your life. Some people will benefit from the good trouble that Jesus Christ puts in your life and brings you through. So never write off someone as being unable to be saved. It has nothing to do with us and everything to do with Jesus. Jesus knows where they are. Jesus knows what they are doing. And Jesus knows how to reach them. So before we finish, I want to take a look at verse 16, last verse in our text. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. We may not always understand the purpose of the storm or see it as good trouble, but God always has a reason for it. God always has a reason for it. And that's our fifth and final life lessons today. God's purpose is always greater than your problem. God's purpose is always, always, somebody say that with me, always greater than your problem. From the sailor's per perspective, we see some something amazing happen. These hardcore, superstitious sailors who had many gods cry out to the God and start to worship him. What I'm saying is the Lord often uses desperate time to wake up people so they will cry out to him. We're in desperate times. More people are going to be crying out to God. Amen. So let me recap these life lessons before we close in, in prayer. Let me recap these good troubles in life. Life lesson number one, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, then you need to live like you are a believer. Life lesson number two, make sure your walk matches your talk. Life lesson number three, what you do impacts how the people around you experience the kingdom of God. Life lesson number four, God uses trouble to shape us into the image of Jesus. And finally, life lesson number five, God's purpose is always greater than your problem. The Lord wants us to get into good trouble, necessary trouble, and redeem the soul of America. Father God, we thank you for this message. Lord, now we get a little snippet of why you take us through good trouble. Actually, it's for our good and for your glory. There's some people who are listening to me this morning or whenever they listen to this message, and they have been wondering why all this trouble is around them. Lord, it could be one of those life points that you are reshaping them into the image of Jesus Christ. There's someone who's listening to this message, Lord, and, and they had, have given up hope because of the pandemic. But Lord, you are using good trouble for a reason. We thank you, O oh God, for this word on this morning. Lord, please breathe life into those who are in despair. Breathe life into those whose hope is dwindling down. Breathe life, O oh God, into those who may be running from you. And if there's someone who heard this word this morning, who don't know you, but they're running from you, please touch their heart. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. 
Stay tuned with us next week as we continue Jonah's story. We're going to be doing part three, and we're going to talk next week about how God does not forget us even when life has swallowed us up with overwhelming circumstances. We're going to talk about Jonah inside of the belly of the whale, but God still found Jonah right there in the belly of the whale. Amen. Let's close with our benediction. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Jesus Christ, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Until we see you next time, be safe, stay healthy, keep your joy. Amen. Stop.